All right, we're going to go uh, get going here. <clears throat> so those of you who don't know me, I'm Ian Grant, uh, Executive Director of the Entrepreneurship Center, the E-Center. Uh, Heather McNeil, who you probably hear from a lot in the back, Senior Program Manager. So, so glad you're here. Just by uh, raising your hands, who's, who's uh, a first time sort of E-Center event is this? All right, fantastic. So welcome, appreciate it. Uh, how many students are doing I2 Passport? Fantastic, love that even more. So thanks for being here, it's really great. Uh, so a couple of things. This is a great, a great program, and, and uh, each semester we do something similar that really focuses on helping students think about how to create ideas. And it all takes a wide range of um, exercises and perspectives to do that. This was a little bit unique, and I'm not going to steal the thunder from the bottom line team. Um, but in general, just a couple things to point out. So bottom line technology, it says here, they are our top corporate sponsor. So they provide funding to help events like this and provide uh, a lot of the other aspects uh, of the e-center. So um, really, really appreciative to that. So just a round of applause to bottom line for that. Thanks. <clears throat> Secondly, and uh, you'll see some of the propaganda on your desks as well. But one of the neat things, so bottom line has uh, really a world-class internship program. So if any of you are on LinkedIn and you sort of follow, you sort of see really over the last couple of months, um, just a number of UNH students uh, who are doing internships at Bottom Line. And that's not necessarily technology, that's finance, that's marketing, it's really everything that you would think about uh, in a company. So um, one of the neat opportunities about being here is that you get to learn a little bit more about Bottom Line uh, as an opportunity. They're just right in Portsmouth, it's not even, it's right on Pease, it's probably a 15 minute drive without snow. Um, so it's, it's really great. <clears throat> and there's something, there's a large number of UNH alums that actually work at Bottom Line. So there's actually a really neat synergy between Bottom Line Technologies uh, and UNH. So at, no matter sort of where you are, I know some of you are first year students, some of you are probably seniors, uh, neat opportunities for you to do. So uh, today's going to be really great. Um, they, this is usually a four hour, half day, full day program. Uh, so they've actually been able to sort of consolidate chunks of it uh, to be really fun exercises. And so I think you're gonna enjoy it. So please welcome uh, Jim, Jenna, and Michelle. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ian, and thanks everybody. We're really glad to be here with you tonight. My voice volume okay? Can you guys hear me in the back? I'm seldom told I speak too softly, but I always like to double check. So as Ian said, my name is Jim Starrett. Uh, this is Jenna and Michelle. We'll do full introductions in a moment. But uh, like I said, we're really glad to be here with you tonight. The opportunity that Ian asked us to pull together for you was really, um, as he said, an element of our formal Agile Foundation program, which is not a half day or a full day, but actually a two day program. So you're really just getting a little bit of a flavor for it. Uh, but we do try to implement adult learning theory approaches to training for everyone in the organization. So what that means for our Agile training programs and workshops is that they are team-based, hands-on, interactive, competitive, and fun. And it's been our experience that if we can bring all those elements in, learning happens as a byproduct. And you're not sitting here to, to just listen to someone talk and talk and talk, whether it's that full two-day program or even the couple of hours that you might spend with us tonight. So we really hope you're going to enjoy it. Uh, we'll give you a little bit of flavor of everything that we're going to look at tonight, but let's jump in and do introductions if we could. So as I mentioned, my name, Jim Starrett. I've been with Bottom Line 10 years now. I'm responsible for our uh, agile transformation, coaching, and training throughout the organization. And while we're not a, a huge company, we're a pretty good sized company, and we have a relatively very large size footprint for our company. So we have offices all over the globe, and we've uh, now been on Agile, using Agile frameworks and approaches for eight years. And we've delivered our Agile training programs across, across the globe to something like eight countries and 16 or so cities, I forget the exact numbers, to over 2,000 employees and business partners. Uh, in Europe, in Asia, and in uh, the United States. So a pretty good footprint for all of that. Uh, in addition to having responsibility for our Agile programs, I also have responsibility for our global development partnerships. So as we work with companies across the globe who partner with us, we've got a number of team members who integrate with our teams and create what we call a large distributed Agile footprint across the organization. Uh, prior to being with Bottomline, I was with Fidelity for 12 years. 
Uh, and I managed a bunch of different teams that were both Agile and Waterfall. If you don't know the difference between those two, we're going to share a little bit about that with you tonight. And as you're all embarking on your post-UNH careers on what you want to do, I hope you'll find whether you want to take an entrepreneurial track or whether you want to take an enterprise corporate, corporate track, you're going to find the concepts, the approaches, the ideas, principles and values that we share with you tonight will be very helpful for you in whichever track you might decide to pursue. So with that, that's a little bit about me. Michelle, would you like to do a, an introduction for yourself as well? Yeah. All right, I'm just going to stand yeah. here because I'm in a little bit of a pickle. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Michelle. I'm the project manager and scrum master for our team. Uh, so currently, my responsibilities, 70% uh, of the time, my, t my time is allocated to my home team, um, just helping them with anything from project management to you know housekeeping, house admin stuff. Uh, and then the other 30%, I help Jim with the global development um, efforts at bottom line. Uh, and just working with our third party contractors and uh, also just helping the team, other teams at bottom line just get their head start with Agile. So great to be here. Thanks, Michelle. Joe? Oh, it's tight back here. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Jenna. I am the enterprise trainer on the enterprise program management team at Bottom Line. Um, enterprise trainer, that's not something I was familiar with when I graduated uh, from college, but what I help do is run our training programs, develop content for our training programs, um, deliver those programs as well, as well as all of the event logistics that go along with that. So nice to meet all of you. Thank you both. And I think it's worthwhile noting that both Michelle and Jenna are recent graduates. They've been on my team for less than two years. And I would say in the 18 to 20 months or so that you've been with us, uh, you've gotten, I think, just a great experience and a great exposure to all things Agile uh, in that period of time, supporting all the company. Uh, Jenna has traveled with me to London. Uh, Michelle has traveled with me to Tel Aviv. Uh, they've gone to additional places as well. So we've got, like I said, a large global footprint. And really working with all the different teams at Bottom Line, uh, I think was a big draw for them in joining the team. And I hope they've had a good time since they've been here. I know we're really glad to have them on the team. So with that, we did our introductions. And normally, we take the time in our programs to get to know each of you individually. We have a really tight time schedule tonight. So unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do that. But instead, as we're going to be working with the exercises that we mentioned, each table has on it a small stack of white paper. If I could ask the people who are closest to that at the back of each table to take one each and then hand it to the other people at your table, I would ask each of you to fold that in half and then in half again to create a name tent. And on your name tent, what I'd like to ask you to do is, of course, put your name. But if you could also share what your major is. And if you're a double major, put both, whichever one you like better first, your choice. But if you could include them up here as we're walking around and helping to facilitate the different exercises, we can at least get to know you a little bit better. And I usually find it's a better approach if you know someone's name when you're working with or helping them. So let me give everybody just a moment or two to do that. You should all have on your tables markers for doing that. If you could write your names in markers and not pens, it'll be a little bit easier for us to read them if we're not directly in front of you. And it's also helpful if you can write your name and your major on both sides of the tent. If you want to fold it laterally this way, this will be helpful. That forms a nice tent. If you could do it that way. I should have modeled that. Okay. Thanks for letting me do that. Um, so yeah, if you want to do it that way, it'll make it nice and easy to read. If you folded it differently, just consider yourself an entrepreneur. You've already gone off on your own and done it your way. That's OK. So if you could remember to do it on both sides, though, again, that's going to help us uh, no matter what side we're approaching your table or helping you out from. Give everyone just another 30 or 45 seconds to do that. Uh, first name is fine. But if you want last name, feel free. If there's a common or two or three of you with the same first name at the table, that might help. While everyone is finishing writing up their names, let me ask a question just to get to know you all a little bit better. How many of you here are in an IT track, a technical track, development or some other technical track for what you're doing? Just by show of hands. How many are in a technical track? Very few, really. Three, four, five? OK. How many of you are on a business track? OK. How many of you are on a track other than technical or business? And what is that track? Pre-med. Pre-med, OK. 
Okay, biomed? Um, Spanish and human development. Okay, wow, all right. Economics. Economics? I would consider that business, but maybe uh, not. You're kind of right. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry? Nursing. Nursing, awesome, okay. So I was thinking I was going to have all of the, the different tracks covered, but okay, you threw out a few that maybe, you know, we don't have a direct line of sight to, but I'm willing to bet we could even find some things that will help you out in those different tracks as well. So keep an eye out for them, keep an ear out, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. All right, everyone good with the name tense? Cool. All right. And this is the back of it with that wonderful animation going on there. So we have that. All right. We wanted to kick off this session with a very simple and quick but really informative video on what Agile is. So we're going to take a look at this video. It was externally produced, not as part of Bottom Line, but if you came to today's session really not understanding what Agile is, or maybe having some ideas, but the ideas that you have uh, may not necessarily be what Agile is about. There are a lot of misconceptions out there. This video, video I hope, will help to set a common base for everyone. So let's take a quick listen. Did we test this? Awesome. All right, here we go. My name is Peter Green, and I'm the Agile Transformation Leader at Adobe. In this video, we're going to attempt to answer a pretty important question that I hear frequently. What is Agile anyway? In a survey of CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, Respondents were asked to rank the attributes that they felt were most important for their companies to be successful in today's business environment. Agility was ranked as one of the top attributes, while attributes like responsiveness and flexibility were ranked pretty low. The authors of the survey were a little perplexed by these results. They assumed that these were synonymous terms, so they followed up with the CEOs and asked them how the term agility was different from flexibility or responsiveness. The CEOs responded that those other terms kind of described a business that was just responding to crises, being blown about by the winds of change, whereas the term agility seemed to denote flexibility with purpose. This is my favorite definition of agility. It's kind of like this guy. He's certainly flexible, but he also has a strong purpose, and his flexibility is simply a means to achieve his purpose. So how did Agile become a term associated with software development processes? In February of 2001, several inventors of what were at the time called lightweight development processes got together at the Snowbird Ski Resort. Their goal was to determine what they all had in common. At this gathering, they came up with the term Agile to describe their similar approaches. The other things they agreed on were published in a Manifesto for Agile Software Development, which you can find at www.agilemanifesto.org. We can think of Agile kind of like this funnel. At the base of the funnel are the four Agile values, which you can find on the website here. These form the foundation for Agile, and based on those four values, they also came up with 12 principles of Agile development, which are also linked to on the main Agile Manifesto site. Based on the values and principles, we have the actual Agile practices, things like having a daily meeting or using an iterative development approach. Groups of Agile practices that work really well together include frameworks like Scrum, or the technical practices like test-driven development, pair programming, that make up the framework known as Extreme Programming, or XP. There are other Agile frameworks as well, things like Kanban, which is based on the idea of limiting work in progress. Or you can come up with your own, custom approach. There are lots of ways to be Agile without using a named framework. So you can be Agile without doing Scrum, and interestingly, a team using the practices of Scrum could do so in a very non-Agile way if they weren't aligned with the values and principles of the Agile Manifesto. The first Agile value, after all, is individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So the people are more important than the process. That overview leads into what is the difference between Waterfall and Agile. Before we jump into that, though, I think Michelle's going to cover this for us, right? Before we jump into it, I want to ask a question. How many of you had an idea about what Agile was before you came tonight? Okay, a little less than half. So maybe that video is good just to set a perspective on the baseline. And, you know, the key thing to learn about it, if you had a conception, for example, that Agile was only for software development, it is not. 
Agile can be applied in many different industries and it can be applied to many different types of products that get created. While the developers of Agile were focused on software development in that Snowbird resort all those years ago, Agile has now really ballooned into a much larger solution for any industry, for any product, for any process that finds it has more work to do than the time frame in which it has to complete that work and not enough resources or not enough people to get that work done. And it's got to find an effective way to prioritize and manage that work while constant change requests are coming in. And that pretty much handles or addresses many of the product development efforts, whether they're software related, whether they're hardware related, or service oriented, or I'd argue even in the medical and biomedical fields, you've got this high sense of urgency for how do you handle work that comes in and has to quickly be triaged and prioritized. It's not a, a whole lot different, except of course you have lives on the line, so there are things there that you have to manage. But you could see applications of it and how it could work out. Agile's now being used in HR groups. It's now being used in marketing in finance, uh, in analytics, in data, uh, in data science, in so many different applications. So Michelle's going to talk next about what the difference between traditional approaches to product development and software development are and how they compare to Waterfall. All set? Oh, actually Jenna. Oh, Jenna, I'm sorry. My mistake. There you go. Jenna's got it. Thanks. Okay, so this is, before we show how Agile is more widely applicable than just software, this is kind of the view, um, the software view of what Waterfall, which is kind of the traditional old way of thinking to complete a project versus Agile. Um, as you can see in this traditional Waterfall version, for completing projects, you kind of stage gate everything. You complete your analysis, then you start your design, and then you code. And finally, after you're coding, you're testing. So it's very stage gated. You have to finish one thing before you can start the other. But with Agile, you're using, um, you're doing smaller chunks of all of these things overlapping. So it's a lot more efficient. And um, we'll show you some of the other benefits as we go along. But I just want you to have this view in your mind um, because we are about to watch a great video that is called the backwards brain bicycle and it's talking about how adults um, if they start doing something one way their whole life it can be extremely difficult to turn that way of thinking around has anybody seen this video before yeah yeah awesome it's a great video i see it like every two <laughs> like twice a month and i still love it um so yeah we're gonna we're gonna see how this man um tries to rewire his brain to unlearn something that he's been doing his whole life. Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. You've heard people say it's just like riding a bike, meaning it's really easy and you can't forget how to do it, right? But I did something. I did something that damaged my mind. It happened on the streets of Amsterdam, and, and I got really scared, honestly. I, I can't ride a bike like you can anymore. Before I show you the video of what happened, I, I need to tell you the backstory. Like many six-year-olds with a MacGyver mullet, I learned how to ride a bike when I was really young. I had learned a life skill and I was really proud of it. Everything changed though when my friend Barney called me 25 years later. Where I work, the welders are geniuses and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike, ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Destin Sandlin. First attempt riding the bicycle. All right. So, the faster I go, the better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I couldn't do it. You can see that I'm laughing, but I'm actually really frustrated. In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. My thinking was in a rut. This bike revealed a very deep truth to me. I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Therefore, knowledge is not understanding. Look, I know what you're probably thinking. Destin's probably just an uncoordinated engineer and can't do it. But that's not the case at all. The algorithm that's associated with riding a bike in your brain is just that complicated. Think about it. Downwards force on the pedals, leaning your whole body, pulling and pushing the handlebars, gyroscopic precession in the wheels. Every single force is part of this algorithm. And if you change any one part, it affects the entire control system. 
I do not make definitive statements that often, but I'm telling you right now, you cannot ride this bicycle. You might think you can, but you can't. I know this because I'm often asked to speak at universities and conferences and I take the bike with me. It's always the same. People think they're gonna try some trick or they're just gonna power through it. It doesn't work. Your brain cannot handle this. For instance, this guy. I offered him $200 just to ride this bike 10 feet across the stage. Everybody thought he could do it. Oh, no, 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 no. No, you didn't understand. You didn't understand. So, this way. <laughs> Once you have a rigid way of thinking in your head, sometimes you cannot change that, even if you want to. So here's what I did. It was a personal challenge. I stayed out here in this driveway and I practiced about five minutes every day. My neighbors made fun of me. I had many wrecks, but after eight months, this happened. One day I couldn't ride the bike and the next day I could. It was like I could feel some kind of pathway in my brain that was now unlocked. It was really weird though. It's like there's this trail in my brain, but if I wasn't paying close enough attention to it, my brain would easily lose that neural path and jump back onto the old road it was more familiar with. Any small distractions at all, like a cell phone ringing in my pocket, would instantly throw my brain back to the old control algorithm and I would wreck. But at least I could ride it. My son is the closest person to me genetically and he's been riding a normal bike for three years. That's over half his life. I wanted to know how long it would take him to learn how to ride a backwards bike, so I told him if he learned how to ride a backwards bike, he could go with me to Australia and meet a real astronaut. Are you gonna give up? No. Go ahead. This is how it starts. Look at this. This is such a big deal. Get up, you got it. Did you see his brain get it? So he in, how many weeks have we been doing this? Two weeks? In two weeks, he did something that took me eight months to do, which demonstrates that a child has more neuroplasticity, am I even saying that right, than an adult. It's clear from this experiment that children have a much more plastic brain than adults. That's why the best time to learn a language is when you're a young child. All right, today's bike log. I can ride smooth, I can ride fast. I'm thinking the experiment is over. Okay, now I'm in Amsterdam, a city that has more bicycles than people. The question is, can I ride a normal bike now? I mean, I've spent all this time unlearning how to ride a bike. If I go back and try to ride a normal one, will my brain mess up? So I've tweeted a Smarter Every Day meetup, if you will, and I'm gonna see if somebody brings a bicycle and I'm gonna try to ride a normal bike. It's backwards, it's backwards. This was one of the most frustrating moments of my life. I had ridden a normal bike since I was six, but in this moment, I couldn't do it anymore. I had set out to prove that I could free my brain from a cognitive bias. But at this point, I'm pretty sure that all I proved is that I could only redesignate that bias. So what you're not seeing is just a group of people here looking at me, looking at the strange American <laughs> that can't ride a bike because they think I'm dumb. But I'm actually two levels deep into this because I've learned and unlearned. All right. After 20 minutes of making a fool out of myself, suddenly my brain clicked back into the old algorithm. I can't explain it, but it happened in a very specific moment. <laughs> I got it, I got it, I got it. I'm back. Oh, it clicked, it clicked, hold it, it clicked. I got it, I got it. Okay, there it is. There was the moment. Okay, I can ride a bike. I tried to explain this to the people around me and they just didn't get it. They thought I was faking the previous 20 minutes and I couldn't get anybody to believe me. That looked like I faked that, didn't it? Yeah. Just a fake. You think I'm faking, you don't believe me. That looks so Actually. weird, you're like, la, la, la. I'm just... You think I'm lying, don't yeah, you? I don't I'm not lying. I felt like the only person on the planet who had ever unlearned how to ride a bike and I couldn't articulate it to anyone because everybody just knew that you can't forget how to ride a bike. 
So I learned three things from this experiment. I learned that welders are often smarter than engineers. I learned that knowledge does not equal understanding. And I learned that truth is truth, no matter what I think about it. So be very careful how you interpret things, because you're looking at the world with a bias, whether you think you are or not. I'm Destin. You're getting smarter every day. Have a good one. All right, so just a quick... Uh... Just a quick debrief on that. First of all, I'm often asked this, and I want to be clear and transparent up front. We do not have the bike. I'm often asked if we had the bike, could we go out and try it? I would actually love to do that. But I pack enough on international trips as it is. I'm not packing a bike. Uh, a couple of key things that he said in that, though. Cognitive bias, right? the frame that you see the world. I, I've often wondered if there was a, a sequel to this film or, or to this short overview video. I'd love to see if he could go back after he relearned in Amsterdam how to ride a regular bike, if he could just switch over and go back and ride the backwards brain bicycle. And I'm willing to bet he could not. Not at least right away. I don't think it would take him eight months again, but it would take him a period of time. The interesting thing we found, it's almost like left hand, right hand, unless you're ambidextrous. You know, it's really hard to switch and learn and then switch back. And even for people who have that skill set, Something as fundamental as riding a bike. How do you forget how to do that? And the neuroplasticity of a brain. My biomed students around here, wherever you are, right? Think about that. How hard is it to unlearn something that you've learned since childhood and then relearn a different way of doing it? We say that to teams often. So if it took someone who I'd call a relatively intelligent adult, eight months to learn how to do something as fundamental as riding a bike, which he'd done for easily decades by this point in his life. How hard is it for a team to unlearn how to develop products and relearn a new way to do it? So if it takes eight months for one individual to relearn something so fundamental, how long does it take an entire team to work well together as a unit and continue to work that way as constant change is happening? We have what we call an agile maturity health check program at work at bottom line. And one of the things we do is we touch base with teams and we see how mature they are on a scale based on the different approaches and practices and tools that they use and results that they achieve. And what we found, even after eight years, no one in the company is feeling like they're at expert level yet. They're all still feeling like it's a journey that they're on and they have to continuously work while they're on that journey. And that's such an important lesson. Real quickly, the analogy that we draw about it is like being on an Olympic team for your country. If you're on a team and you made the Olympics and you can represent your country, how incredibly powerful is that? But does that mean that you're gonna be guaranteed to win a medal? It doesn't. You're gonna go to the Olympics and you're gonna compete against other countries with teams just as incredible as yours. But let's say you go to that Olympics and you actually win gold as a team. That's even more incredible. Does that accomplishment, though, guarantee you and your team four years later in the next Olympics that you're going to be invited back? Anyone know? It doesn't, right? What do you have to do in the intervening four years? Train, Train compete, demonstrate that you can win, and you have to earn a right back on to the Olympic team to be able to generate. To, to be able to uh, compete, rather, for, for what you're doing. So as you're taking a look at that, product development teams, software development teams, many industries, it doesn't matter. Change is happening all the time. You know, in the Olympics, the technology changes for what gets used, the teams changes, the, the coach changes, right? So many things change. The same is true for business. As leaders change, team members change, tools, technology change, innovation comes in, new competitors come in, new customer expectations. How do you balance all of that? You need a process that is just as pliable and just as responsive that you can integrate. So that's what a lot of that brings back. One last point about it. How many of you speak more than one language in this room? Fluently. <laughs> Saw three, three or four hands just went down as soon as I said fluently. So a small handful. For all of you, whose hands? Can you put them back up? Because I want to ask you all a question again. Go ahead, Michelle. I know you speak a couple there. Um, how many of you learned as a child the second or third or however many languages you, you speak? A few of you? The majority of you. How much easier is it for us to learn as a child that new language than as an adult? And by the way, I'm putting a really loose definition on adult here, which is like, you know, 12 years and up, 
right? If you're in that middle school or, long, uh, or older, how hard is it to learn that second language? So it's that same idea. Your brain gets very fixed. You get those cognitive biases and how you process information. So the challenge is, is a big one. So as we took a look back at this last slide, if I can pull this up here, the way that people are so used to working when we bring them into our product development approach, analysis first, then design, then code, then test, breaking that cycle of expectation, not just within the team, but within the organization around the team and with the customers for whom we're developing the products and the services, that's our challenge. And so while all this may seem so logical to have this continuous set of activities, logic doesn't translate to being easy. And that's where the challenge is. If you're up for it and if you're really good at helping your team members and the organization you work with, or if you want to be an entrepreneurial team, to really focus on that, knowing these skills will have tremendous value to you in your careers. Any questions or any feedback on that? Does that resonate, hopefully? Do you see the challenge? But you're here at a great innovation program at UNH, so I have to think you're preparing for it. Yes? So it's basically what you're saying is that we're trying to kind of relearn what would be the traditional method and try to think more in kind of out agile methods. Or something. Yeah, it's recognizing that there is a traditional method. And as you know, the question was, are we trying to relearn the original method so that we can learn the agile method? Really, it's recognizing what the original method is and understanding why that method in today's world, the pace of technology, the pace of change, is just not an adequate process that translates well to success for most companies. And so how do we find a better way to do it? We have a better way. It is, like we, like we like to say, easy to understand, but hard to put into practice and maintain it. And so it's really being aware of what that original method is, but then saying you not only can understand and follow the new method or the agile method, but why it's there in the first place and when to apply it. Good question, thank you. Any others? All right, so with that, I'm gonna hand it to Jenna this time. Yeah. And I think I got that one right, okay. Here you go, okay. thanks. Thanks. Yep. All right, so these are gonna be a couple of ways to work in an agile way. We're not even gonna get into all the frameworks you heard that first video talk about, like Scrum and XP. Those, we, we can skip past this for now because um, this, these little hints will apply to any project or product that you guys might ever take on, uh, any deliverable, any solution. So working in an agile way, one way is to develop iteratively. So that means just starting simple, and as you move along, you're adding incrementally to this project or product, whatever it might be. Um, adaptive planning is something that you should practice if you're going to be agile. So a lot of the, most of the time, reality changes and throws the curveball at you during any type of project. Um, so if you're agile, you are willing to change your plans rather than attempt to change reality. Roles on an agile team will blur. So it's kind of like a mini startup. If you are um, on a team and you say are um, d a developer or a QA, you might be asked to perform some of those roles and do some skill, use some skills that are overlapping with each other. We like to say that an agile team has all of the skills on it that are needed to get the work done. So you're not just stuck to performing uh, that hard and fast, whatever you saw on LinkedIn. And feedback is super important for an Agile project. Uh, um, with our customers, they get a chance to um, give their feedback frequent and early and often. And because of this, they get a, a chance to feel a real sense of ownership and they feel like they're actually guiding the direction of their project. And this is better than showing it to them at the very end without getting their feedback along the way. And they tell you, well, we don't want this, we don't like this, when all along we could have been getting this response throughout the duration of the project. Um, the Agile Manifesto was alluded to in the first video. And these are some of the engineers that, that created this manifesto. Um, the most important thing you should know about this is that the four values in the center are kind of what we center all of our practices around. So they say individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. And then it says 
while there is value on the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. So we uh, try to carry these out in our work uh, every day. And then there are 12 Agile principles. But that's a lot, so I'm not going to read those off to you. I'm going to have you guys um, kind of get to know and work with these principles. So there are pieces of paper around the room, um, and your tables have little sticky notes with numbers. So just find the sticky note corresponding to the paper on the wall. And what I'm going to have you do is I'll assign two principles, two or three principles to each table. And you guys are going to read through it, discuss as a team um, what a summary of that principle could be. You can only use up to three unique words to summarize that principle. And I would also like you to draw an image of what that principle is speaking to you and your team. And then I'll have everyone report back in about five, six minutes. Um, so table one, you'll do principles one and two. Table two, principles three and four. Are you guys? Table three, five, and six. Um, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Got it? Are there any questions about what we're doing? OK, I'll leave this on here so you can refer back to them. So summarize three unique words and an image. All right, six minutes. OK, so now what I want you guys to do, um, one person at your table, one or two people, you can decide. Uh, I want you to read the class, your full principle, and then explain your three words and your image. You guys ready? All right, let's start with you. Do you want to, you might have to come look at the full principle over here. All right, so our full principle to start off is R, so it's the highest priority to satisfy the customer through early and continuous develop, uh, delivery of valuable software. So basically our interpretation of that was that we need constant customer communication. So if you're going to have software that is useful, if you're going to have software that kind of satisfies customer needs, you need to hear what the customer wants. So it's a major requirement is to get that feedback. And as you develop a product, make sure there's a loop back where you're hearing feedback, developing, redeveloping, kind of continuing that circle. And that's your image. And nice. our image is, yeah, a little bit of a full circle there. I mean, there's, we're cutting out the middleman a little bit, but we're just keeping it brief. Great, um, thank you. Our second deliverable is the welcome. So it's changing requirements, even in late development. And agile processes harness change for customers' competitive advantage. And our term that we kind of went with was adaptation of requirements. So basically, you could have, you could come in, you could have customers saying one thing, they hear feedback from a third party, somebody else, and then they put in a change order and you have to be basically an agile company, stay on your toes, and pretty much have a developmental process that you can change at a moment's notice. You know? So we wanna be, be able to adapt to the requirements that are requested of us while maintaining the feedback and saying like, hey, we can do that, we can't do that. You know? And those are our deliverables. So and we, uh, we have yet to develop a picture for the adaptation of requirements. Well, um, we'll give you, we'll give you yeah, some time. Yeah, we're just for some, some customer point. feedback. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's great, yes, perfect, thank you. So yeah, you did a great job. Um, all right, let's go to table two. Okay, so, so oh, did you want to say I can just do it. Okay. So, so, we, so we did number three and four. So number three is deliver. So working software frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with a preference to the shorter time scale. Then number four is business, which is people and developers must work together daily through the project. So right here is ours. So deliver, we drew a, um, one of the team members drew a box with a clock on it. So it's like trying to deliver something to someone, but in a you know, fairly quick period of time, so nice. as quickly as possible. So for the three words, we used efficiency, deadlines, and optimization. Awesome. And for a business, we did um, 
a drawing of two people trying to communicate because that's sort of what what number three I'm sorry number four seems to fall under is the importance of people kind of communicating and you know stuff like that and being able to sort of bring new ideas to the table and work together and stuff and so the three words we did for this one was collaboration communication and cooperation so thank you thank you okay table three all right, so we had five, which is build projects around motivated individuals, give them the environment and support they need, and trust them to get the job done. So for that one, our three words were create, assist, and accomplish. And for our picture, we have a guy on top of a, a mountain, uh, but he didn't get there alone. Two other guys with ladders helped him get up there. So they assisted him, they encouraged him, um, and kind of gave him the materials he needed to get there. Uh, we also had six, so that's the most efficient effective method of conveying information to and within a, a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. Um, so we had communication, collaboration, and structure for the three words for that. Um, and here we have two people communicating face-to-face. -face. Awesome. Great job. Thank you. Okay. I think we're going back here to you guys. What are your three words and did you get pictures? Yeah, you did. Great. So working, um, we did words out like collaborating and development. So we took a picture of two people working together, um, and because something gets done single handedly, you have to work together, uh, get the job done. And then eight was agile. So we talked about flexibility with purpose. Um, we like that saying a lot. And our picture was kind of just swiggly lines, like continuous. Um, and then nine, we did um, it was continuous. Oh, wait. Thank you guys. All right, our last table, the last three principles. Oh yeah. <laughs> you guys got a track. Yeah, do one of you guys want to read out for her? Ten. Uh, so 10 was simplicity. The art of maximizing the out of, amount of work not done uh, is essential. So we, our picture was a circle because um, we did, excuse me, easy, fast, and understandable. We figured that a circle is as basic as it gets. Yeah, I love um, that. Easy to draw, easy to understand, and pretty quick. Um, and then 11. Uh, 11 was best architecture's requirements and design of work self-organizing teams? So we drew a diamond because we thought that it represented um, refined, innovative, and top of the line. So those were kind of our words that described that. And then Perfect. number 12. Uh, number 12 was regular. Uh, regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective, then tunes and adjusts the behavior accordingly. So um, I think this was a timeline, right? Yeah. yeah, so we drew a timeline and our words were scheduled, repeated, and basic because it takes um, a long period of time. You never know what it's going to what it's gonna take um, and you need to refine it yourself. Great. Thank you guys. Very creative. Nice drawings too. I think there should be more art majors in here than, than I'm seeing. So we, we did this ourselves. Um, this is just what we came up with. There's no right answers. Whatever helps you embody or remember these principles is what works. Um, we, for number one, we put delight the customer. Number two, welcoming change. Three, iterative delivery. Four, daily business collaboration. Trusting motivated teams. Face-to-face -face conversation. It's kind of, that's four words, I know. Um, working product, sustainable pace, technical excellence, keeping it simple, self-organizing teams, and inspect and adapt. So hopefully you might be able to remember some of the images, the mountain, the business, the business with the windows and the circles over there when you're reflecting on some of these principles and um, might be easier for you guys to remember. So I think we have another exercise. This one's a quick one. So um, it's called the name game. Jim's going to take us through it. Sure. So one of the misconceptions there is about teams working in Agile is it just means you do more stuff faster. And then once you deliver that, you do more stuff even faster. And then you can take change at any time, and everybody can do everything, and there's no boundaries, and you can multitask and do just everything better because you're Agile. Do you think any of that is true? Well, some of it is true. 
but not so much because just being agile is like a magic wand that you can wave. But we try to say, as a team and within our organization, there are smarter ways to work, and let's focus on them. This is a very simple exercise, it's very quick, but that word focus comes into play and it's very important. Here's what I'd like to ask you to do. Does someone on each table have a smartphone with them? <laughs> yes, I know, I should see all hands go up, but who's the first one? Great, you're gonna use you, who on this team? You, who on this team? You, over here? You, awesome, someone here? Awesome, all right, so what I'd like you to do is bring out that smartphone, bring up your timer. You all have your name tense in front of you, so even if everyone at the table doesn't know everyone else, can you clearly see everybody else's name? Yes? If you can't, make sure the name tense are visible, not obscured by anyone's sight on your team. Here's what I'd like to ask you to do. Everyone should have in front of you a post-it note. There were six per table, so there's enough for each person on that table. I'd like to ask everyone else, except the person who's doing the timing, everyone else on the team, you're gonna write the, not yet, wait till, wait till we say start, but here's the instructions. You're gonna write the name of each of your team members, just the first name, keep it simple, just the first name of all of your team members, including the team member who's keeping time. So if you're a table of six, you're writing six names. Table of five, five names. Table of four, four names, easy enough, yes? But you're going to write everyone's first name, just one on top of each other, on the post-it note. Couldn't be any more simple than that. Yes? You write your own name, too. You write your own name, too. So everyone on the team, including your own name, that's why six is six, five, five, four, four. Everybody good with that? Just for clarity, here's how it looks when you're going to be writing it out. Easy enough, yes? Now, each of you do not begin writing the first name until the person keeping time at your table says begin. Once you've finished writing your name, raise your hand. For the person keeping time for your team, when the last hand at your table goes up, stop the timer. So when you say start, start the timer. When the last hand goes up, stop the timer. Everyone good with that? Any questions? All right, everyone, timers, as soon as you're ready, tell your teams to start. When your team is done as the timer, can you raise your hand? And when all the timers' hands go up, I'll know we're done. Everybody good to go? All right, off you go. So everybody's done? Great. All right, let's take a look. For team one, what was your time? How long did it take all your team members to write your first name? 18 seconds. 18 seconds. Team two? 21 seconds. 21 seconds. Team three? 17.12. 17.12. Math major? No, entrepreneur, okay. <laughs> <laughs> team four? 8.23, not to be outdone. 8.23. Look at how fat, well, that's a team of four. Don't be too impressed. All right, team number five. <laughs> I'm sorry? 12.28. Okay, here's the thing. We're gonna ask you to do the exact same thing. Take off that top page from your post-it note. Timekeepers, you're gonna do the exact same thing, only I'm gonna predict your team members can't do it as fast this time. They're gonna do the exact same thing, but I'm gonna change it up a little bit because we have a lot going on in the, in the mix. Here's how we'd like you to redo it the second time. Everyone, please write down the exact same set of names. You can even keep that sheet in front of you as a guide if you need it. How much easier could I make it? Well, except for one small little change. Here's how I'm gonna ask you to write the names of everyone on your team. Watch the animation, please. Is that clear? You need me to rerun the animation or you think you got it? All right, timekeepers, when you're ready, say go. The hands and then the last hand goes up. Stop the timer, go ahead. All right, let's see the results. We're gonna start backwards this time. Team five, how long was yours? 36.7 seconds. Team four, 21.69, interesting. Team three, sorry over here. 45.43. 45.43. Team two, 
Winner, winner, over here, 54.7. 54. And team one? Uh, 40.82. 40.82. Wow, did any of you expect that? It looks difficult. Well, you're writing the exact same names. You already did it once. Why is it so much harder the second time? Or why does it take so much longer, whether or not you consider it harder, the second time? Yes? It's sort of like that game, if you've ever seen, where it's like a color that's in green, and it says yellow, and you're supposed to like say the color that it is or whatever. They're like definitely reminding me of that. Like, yeah, the way your brain processes the information, right? Exactly. That's absolutely one reason. Anyone else? I hadn't heard that, but I like the analogy. Yes. Well, it's kind of like the message you guys want to get across with the agile method. You're kind of like trying to retrain, re, re, relearn something, and then the more you do it, you become better at it. So. Right. But I'm hoping that we're not going to retrain you to write names like this. <laughs> right? So there's a deeper lesson that we're trying to get to here. Can anyone think of what it might be? Yes. Um, you're jumping between a bunch of different projects and a bunch of different sections at a time. Exactly. Yeah, and so the answer is you're jumping back and forth between a bunch of different activities. First of all, does your brain process information normally this way? It's not natural, right? I mean, you, we write left to right here. Yes, there's some languages. You write, you know, reverse, right to left. But still, it's not natural to go from word to word, letter to letter, in this fashion. So the brain is simply slower to process it, slower to be able to produce that output, right? Second of all, think about how simple a task is, writing a few names down. Carry that forward to working in an actual environment where you're asked to start work on this task, stop that, start work on this one, stop that, start this one, oh wait, a new priority, stop that, here's a whole nother item. Or take a situation where there's three teams up here, and you, my lucky individual, you're going to share on all three teams. We're going to divide one third of your time to this team, one third to this team, and one third to that team. That's very even keeled, don't you think? Very Solomon-like. We'll just give you 33% of your time here, 33% here, and 33% here. How do you feel about that plan? Are you happy with that? Uh, mixed about <laughs> Yeah, you should not be happy with that. <laughs> and here's the reason why I'm, I'm kind of setting you up for that. The time that you're spending your one-third of the time with this team, these other teams aren't sitting here going, when's Brennan coming? I don't know. We've got to sit around and wait for him to get here before we do anything. They're already progressing and moving on. So when you finish the effort, whatever your tasks were on this team, and you come to this team, now you've got to take somebody's time to get you caught up. What have they been doing? You've got to get caught up on what they're doing. You finally figure all that out. You contribute. You do what you're doing. Now you have to go to your third team. Well, the team that you left, do you think they're waiting for you to come back? Nope. Meanwhile, this team's moved ahead two-thirds of the other two teams because now you're just getting with them. And there's this tax that you have to pay. You end up paying it as an individual in terms of overtime just to keep pace with all the teams that you're working on. Or the company will pay it in a tax in that we may only allocate you 20% to each of these three teams. That's a 40% reduction in productivity if we have to split you across three individual teams. But do you see the reason why? Just for you to process and catch up, means that someone's got to pay that time for that added work. And then you're actually pulling the rest of the team as well, unless you're able to get caught up independently, which isn't always the case. So we run this game to really talk about, recognize the impact of context switching on yourself as an individual, on your team as a unit, and on the organization with regard to productivity. Quality will suffer. Focus will suffer. You're not really motivated because you're very tired, and you're feeling like you're not making a difference individually. So being agile doesn't mean you get to do anything and work on anything and not have a focus with your team. It means the exact opposite. And understanding that and bringing it into your work individually is important. Finally, for those of you who are like me, a little bit OCD, you kind of want to do a little bit of everything and you kind of jump around, you can choose to do multiple things all at the same time. And you might even call yourself a phenomenal multitasker. It's like a badge, right? You can wear it. If you can multitask on many things, aren't you great? The reality is the more that you jump around from one thing to another thing, the less that you're actually getting done. One thing in Agile that we like to say specifically Kanban is stop starting and start finishing. If you're working on three, four, five, six different things at once, just because that's how you like to work, try it out, experiment. 
work on something beginning to end and then pick up something else. Now sometimes you're blocked or there's a dependency. I'm not talking about those circumstances. Sometimes the manager or someone else on the team or a leader or a customer may come in and say here's a new priority. You may not have as much control over that. But you can control yourself and what you choose to work on. So choose wisely. And this I hope helps to drive home that message. Does that make sense? Any questions or feedback on that? Really simple exercise. Yes. So I mean, could like delegation be seen as kind of an aspect of ag of agile process because essentially it's like you're trying to delegate this task to this person, so they're not kept jumping from place to place. So that means they're kind of specialized in what they're doing and kind of sticking to it. So the question was, is delegation like an aspect of agile? Right. What does anyone think? How do you think that plays in? What has to happen for someone to delegate? It's <clears throat> doesn't know the entire aspect of the situation here. And how well can one person know the entire aspect of complex projects? Not well. Not well. In addition, if someone's delegating, it's, it means they have the authority to delegate. And if we look at a team that's supposed to be self-directed and self-motivated, they should be sharing equally the responsibilities. Jenna's slide about how the roles are blurring. Development can help test. Test can help create you know, work that developers can do. They can develop automation. So the lines are blurring. So delegation shouldn't be happening. Instead, people should be saying, I can do that, I can do that, or who on the team can. And the team gets to work as a unit and know how to cross-train one another. Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. Any other questions? All right. <clears throat> How was the break? We have a lot that we want to cover. So everybody good if we just roll on, or do we need to take a five-minute break? If you can really do a five-minute break. Or are we good to roll on? You guys can make it two hours. Right? We can, so you can. All right, we're going to go with it then. All right, coin game. Yeah. Jenna? Coin game. Okay, so this is uh, another exercise. We're going to talk about um, iterative... Uh, cycles and the learning that comes with small frequent batches so <coughs> we do one of you want to hand out the coins yeah. so what I'll need you to do is um, you're gonna have to clear the perimeters of your table because you'll be passing your coins around in a circle um, one person will be the timer so if you want to keep it whoever was whoever timed for the last exercise can be the timer for this exercise as well um, you'll each be receiving a stack of 10 coins and whoever starts with the coins, can you make sure that all of the coins are laid out in front of you, all heads up. That's your first task. So what you'll be doing is that first person will start with those coins facing heads up. The timer will begin. And you will have to, that first person will stack those coins into a sta one stack that has all the coins facing the same way. When they've completed that full stack, they'll push that stack over to the next person in the circle who will then, who will then inspect the coins by flipping it over and building up that stack again with the coins facing the other way. So let's just watch this video and hopefully that will do a better job explaining. Ready, three, two, one, go. Does that make sense? Do you kind of understand what you're doing? So yes, so the first person who starts will take them out of the tape and put them all heads up. He, will, he or she will build that stack all heads up, pass it to the next person who will flip each coin individually up into a new stack and then it will repeat until the end. The last person will have a stack of coins, in 10 coins facing, all the coins facing the same way. And then the timer can stop the clock at that point. Does that make sense? The second person would be all tails up, yes. Okay, are you guys ready to go? All right, this is gonna be really quick, so on your mark, oh, you're not ready. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't this isn't competitive. Well, it is. It is. <laughs> it's not competitive, but it might be a little competitive. We'll see.
Okay, we're gonna record the times now. So, team table one, team one, what was your time? Our time was 42 seconds, uh, 24 seconds. Nice, 42. Okay, team two, what did you guys get? 46 seconds. 46. We, we had to retire. <laughs> I know, I know. Okay, <laughs> this team, we we're saying roughly a minute 12. <laughs> a minute 12. <laughs> That's just the official. We had bonus seconds. an extra person Okay, team four. 54? Okay, 54 seconds. Team five. One seventeen. All right. Okay. So we're going to do this another time. And this time, instead of a stack of 10, I want you to do the same thing, but in batches of five. So that means when the first person starts stacking their coins, once they've stacked all heads up a stack of five, they can pass that complete stack of five onto the next person while they are working on their second stack of five. The last person at the end, though, does need to have that complete stack of 10 by the end of the round. Does that make sense? So basically splitting it up into... Batches of five. Two batches of five. All right, you guys can begin whenever you're ready. We're going to get the times now. Team one, how do you guys do this time? 38.8. 38.8, nice. You dropped about 10 seconds. All right, team two. 28.38. 28 seconds. 83. 28.83, okay. Great. Team three? 51.20. Okay, nice work. Team four? That's great. That's a significant reduction. Yep. And then team five? 38. Awesome. Okay, so you can already see the reduction in time as we're doing it in um, using two batches instead of one large batch. So our third round is our last round. What do you think we're going to be doing this time? We will still have to inspect each individual coin. So what's going to happen is you start with your pile of heads up, you flip one coin, and you pass that coin as you flip the second coin. At the end, you will need it all to be, again, in a 10 stack of coins. But we're, use, we're now using one, um, batch sizes of one. Does that make sense? OK, this is going to go fast. So get ready. All right. Go ahead and start. Let's let's get our, our final times up on the board. Team five, we'll start with you. How'd you guys do? What was it? Nineteen. Oh, team five. Sorry, I switched it up on you. <laughs> Nineteen point oh four. You cut your time almost in half. That's awesome. Team four. Great. Wow, look at that. Team three? 20.08. 20.08. Team two? 15.35. Nice. And team one? All right. So if you look at your first times compared to your last times, what do you guys think that the impact of small batch sizes, small iterations can be? More Definitely more efficient. Yeah. When somebody is always working on something, instead of having to wait for one person to finish the work before the second person can start, and the last person has to wait for everybody until they complete it, there's a huge improvement in these times. So think about that when you are doing work and always look for more efficient routes throughout your, your projects. Okay. Next All up. right. All right, uh, before I go to the next slide, I wanna ask a uh, show of hands, how many of us have social media? 
Great, everyone all around. All right, so I'm gonna take you guys back to summer of 2017. There was like this revolutionary product of the time that came out. Does anyone wanna take a guess what that was? Oh, that's a good one, but it wasn't fidget spinners. Uh, so that product was Romp Him. Does anyone remember that? Yeah. It was the guy's romper. It went viral summer of 2017. Uh, it was actually created by four students, Elaine Chen, Alex Newman, Chip Longnecker, and Daniel Webster Clark. Uh, senior year of their, uh, while they were attending Northwestern University, Kellogg School of Management. Uh, their company actually f uh, is closing this year, um, in spite of the fact that they raised $355,000 during their Kickstarter campaign because they thought that the men's romper was going to be this viral new trend that everyone was going to get ahead of. So what happened? They really relied on exclusivity and virality on social media, um, but they failed to really build a customer base. And also, um, they lacked uh, incorporating validated learning uh, through their product development. So we're going to learn about what validated learning is. So a great book I'd like to recommend to you guys is called The Lean Startup by Eric Rice. Um, he's also co-authored a couple other books um, on modern management. Really good for young entrepreneurs to just get out and see uh, what types of work are out there. Uh, so within his book, Eric talks about the MVP, uh, which is a minimum viable product. So he defines MVP as the version of a new product which allows teams to maximize the amount of validated learning uh, from customers uh, with the least amount of effort required. So what does that mean? So MVP is something that, for example, Romp Him could have uh, incorporated into their product development cycle. MVP utilizes this feedback loop called build, measure, and learn. So essentially, it's just an incremental process of incorporating customer feedback into your product development. And a lot of times when startups uh, begin out, they feel like they have a product that the customer wants, and more importantly, that this is a product that the customer will buy. A lot of times during that product development process, what they fail to do is get the actual tangible product in front of their prospective customers. So when they fail to see this broad uptake uh, within their customer base, I bet you guys can guess why. It's because the customer has never seen the product in the first place. How, is, how can the startup know that this is really the customer that the, pro uh, that, sorry, uh, really the product that the customer will really want to purchase? So by utilizing MVP and especially this uh, feedback loop of build, measure, and learn, uh, you can really incorporate um, this validated learning into your product development process and help you build the right product. So we're gonna show you a video, but before we go to the video, I wanna show you a quick picture of what MVP really looks like. So let's just say that I as a customer and we've all split into two groups. So let's say team red and team green. So I as a customer, my, my goal is just to get from point A to point B. So let's start with the red team. So throughout our four stages of meeting, this is the product that you guys have bought me. Up until the last stage, I'm, I, at that stage, I'm able to get from point A to point B. But the first three times we've met, I'm unable to do that. But with MVP and incremental learning, throughout all four stages, like let's say team green, I'm able to achieve my goal. But uh, while I'm able to achieve my goal, you get to really improve your process to achieve my final goal, which is to get a car. Does that resonate with everybody? Great. So we're going to show you a video. Um, it goes a little bit more in depth into what MVP is. Minimum viable product or MVP. Now, We've all heard this term being used lately, but a lot of us seem to misunderstand what it really means. Allow me to illustrate. Say you invent a super delicious food concept. You're convinced that the world will love it. Your friends and family certainly did. So you decide to start a business. Your vision to bring delight to the mouths of the entire world. But you don't want to get ahead of yourself. So you decide that you'll start with an MVP which in your case would be a small restaurant in one city. So you scope out a good location downtown, sign a one-year lease, and
And now all you have to do is wait for the people to show up. Only problem is, they don't. People simply don't like what you're selling. And now suddenly, you're stuck with a one-year lease and no revenue. You suffer the losses. But hey, at least you stuck to the MVP, right? Actually, this is where people get it wrong. To carry out an MVP, you have to first ask yourself, what is the value that you're offering? In our example, the value isn't the restaurant, it's the food concept. And your MVP should set out to validate if this concept is something people really care about. So did you really need an entire restaurant to test your food concept? Perhaps you could have opened up a food stall at a nearby event. Maybe then you would have learned that it wasn't really your dish that people loved, but the spices you used in the dish. This would allow you to iterate and instead sell your spices. And you don't even need a restaurant for that. An MVP isn't about simply releasing a reduced version of your final product. It's about learning and validating with the least amount of effort and resources. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. Dropbox. Before even having a working product, they released a three-minute explainer video that simply showed the value they wanted to offer. The people who watched it loved what they were seeing. Dropbox's waiting list jumped to 75,000 customers overnight. Then we have the founder of Zappos, who had envisioned a world where people shop for their shoes on the internet. To validate his thesis, he asked the owners of local shoe shops if he could take photographs of their shoes. He then posted these pictures on his website along with their prices. It was only if and when the orders came in that he'd go to the store, purchase the shoes and ship them to his customers. This MVP was certainly not scalable, but it did its job to validate that the value he sought to deliver was something people wanted. The goal of an MVP is validated learning. You need to prove that the customer wants what your vision will offer. The process of your vision is often irrelevant. I mean, do you really care about how the diodes, cathodes or liquid crystals that make up your computer screen work? No, you just care that it offers you that crisp display and you're willing to pay for it. Hey guys, this is- All right, uh, so, a key lesson in this video and throughout the last couple slides uh, was how Agile really allows you to build in that iterative feedback loop that we just showed, showed you of build, measure, and learn. And something that uh, by utilizing that process, we can, how team one pointed out that customer communication, how we can build that in into our product development cycle and really um, utilize validated learning. Uh, so that was our final content piece of the day. We're actually going to go into our final exercise before we say goodbye for the night. Uh, so that's called the Marshmallow Challenge. Have we had a... Anyone heard of it? Anyone's played it? Okay, nice. We got some experts in the room. <laughs> okay. All right, everyone. So we're going to play this exercise called the Marshmallow Challenge. I'm sorry, by show of hands, how many did it again? I saw about a half dozen or so. Two, four. Okay, so for those of you who played it before, play along, be a full team member, strategize with your team. This is going to be a competitive exercise. If you really come up with the tallest tower, you could win what are some phenomenal prizes, I've got to say. We really looked hard at what we could bring, so we've got some great prizes. So get your competitive juices running. Here's what you're going to build. But before we start that, we'd like to share a little story. There's a Harvard professor whose name is Alan McCormick, and he spends his time, among many other things, studying companies and how they produce products and how the processes they use are. Well, there was this one company several years back that asked him to come in and, and really take a look at two different projects that they had at the company. One which they described as quote unquote a good project and the other is a quote unquote a bad project. And they really wanted to learn how to produce more of the good projects. So what did the company define as a good project? Well, when he came in, he asked that question. What they said was, well, here's a project that had a good design up front. It had a good plan up front. 
It had a specified schedule. It had a specified timeline. It had a specified outlook that it was supposed to achieve or look that it was supposed to achieve. And everything pretty much was run and managed by the book. That is really the type of project we want to continue to, to have our teams follow and deliver. And he said, interesting. Okay, tell me about your bad project. What don't you want to see a team do? And they said, well, this other project, I got to tell you, it started off chaotic. There was just no real general defined goal up front that uh, was recognizable to what the end product ended up being. It was chaos throughout the whole process. It came in a little bit later than what we wanted. Not a lot late, but still later than the really good project. And it came in a little bit over budget and it, it delivered different things than what we thought it would. Some of them were good, but, but we really just didn't hit that initial target. And we don't want to see that kind of project perpetuate. And he said, okay, interesting again. He goes, now, let me ask you all a question. I'm going to ask you the same question he asked. What do you think might be missing, missing from your definitions of good and bad projects? Any ideas? You heard what they said was a good project, project that ran well, on time, on budget, the output matched kind of the design and the plan up front, and the team was able to kind of stick with that plan and nail it. But the second project, more chaotic, right? Came in a little bit later, a little bit more costly, didn't exactly deliver what they wanted up front, even though they acknowledged there were some things that were good about it, they just felt like that chaos wasn't worth the output. What do you think might have been missing from those two definitions? Yes. Just sort of adaptability in terms of they basically were saying the only way we want to do this is the way we think about it up front without considering potential changes along the way. So the, the answer, and I thank you for that. You're right on some, some elements of that. Adaptability. The only way they wanted to process a project was to really see what was designed up front is what got delivered on the back end. Yes? I'm looking for something more fundamental. You're correct on that. But something even more fundamental from those definitions of good quote unquote and bad quote unquote. Anyone think of it? Yes. The customer was nowhere in the definition. How did the market react to the product? How did their customers feel about the solution? So when Alan McCormick asked the company those questions, he didn't get back quite as confident a perspective on what was good and what was bad. And then after a little bit of dialogue, begrudgingly it came out, well, that second process, that one that was a bit more chaotic and a bit more unpredictable, actually did four times better in the market in terms of what the estimated uh, expectation was for it than the first product did. And he really challenged them to say, how can you not incorporate that into your definition of success? How would you do with four really well-run projects, none of which hit a home run in the marketplace? versus one that did, and which would you rather repeat, even if it's a bit messy. So that's an important element. We're gonna take this lesson learned now into the Marshmallow Challenge. I'm gonna lay out some parameters for you, and I'm gonna ask you all to collaborate. And remember those lines blurring in the roles? If we were doing this in our Agile Foundation training, which is where we offer this, this exercise, you would be playing specified roles of product owner or scrum master or scrum team, developers and QA engineers. We're not doing that today, but you're still going to be a team collaborating and working today. How you go about the work that you do and the output of what you deliver, that's what we're going to see as a team. So here's an overview of the Marshmallow Challenge. Typically, we give 18 minutes for it. Ian has specifically told me that you're all a very smart group, so we're only going to give you 10 minutes today to do this exercise. But I don't want you to be daunted by that. I've seen it done in less, so you can do it in 10 minutes. So we're going to be fast, because we, we want to finish up by 7.30. We know some of you have classes and maybe other activities. However you want to do it, we want to try and finish up by 7.30 today. So we're going to give you 10 minutes for it. Every team's going to have four or five. Looks like we have that on every team. So we're good to go there. And the goal is going to be to build the tallest freestanding structure with the supplies that we give you. And those supplies are being handed out now in Ziploc bags. They include 20 sticks of spaghetti, one yard of tape, one yard of string, and one marshmallow. Who are my timekeepers from the name game? You guys, if you could count for me 
All right, then someone else pick up the roll. If you could count for me the number of sticks of spaghetti that you have in your package, make sure that you have 20. If anyone is missing one, we'll gladly replace it. If any are broken, we'll gladly replace it. However, once the exercise starts, you can break apart the spaghetti, depending on your design for your tower, but you will not get any replacements. Yeah, and we have to do that. So once you're done with the spaghetti, raise your hand and let me know if you're good to go. Good? Okay. You guys good? You good? Okay. You guys still counting here, here, and here? Give you a second. Okay. One second. You guys good back there? Yep. You need one more here? Okay. You guys good back there? 20? All right. So we had one here that we need. All right. Everyone? Can everyone's attention for a moment? We have one more guideline. Sorry, everyone, when I raise my hand up, can I have your attention? Forgot to give that little custom. All right, one more guideline. You each have a string that is three feet long, one yard. Can you use your tape to measure the same length of tape as you have length of string? That's going to be how much tape you have to use during the exercise. Is my request clear? All right, go ahead and measure that out so you have one full yard of tape that will be part of your exercise. We've got to replace this picture. We never use that tape. So get it. All right. Once you're done, just go ahead and throw that extra tape unit into your bag. Dispenser, that's the word I was looking for. Throw that tape dispenser into your bag. It's been a long day. All right, everyone good? You guys have your tape? You guys have your tape? Yes? You guys have your tape? Almost, you guys good? You guys good back there? All right, nice, you guys have your tape? Okay, you're cutting your tape into little pieces? Interesting, you already have a strategy. Okay, good to go. All right, can I have everyone's attention for the rest of the exercise? Yeah, I don't want to go anymore. Okay, so you're now going to have 10 minutes. The time is 712. You're going to have until 722, just 10 minutes to build your towers. Build them in the center of the table. Remember they're freestanding. If you've ever watched any of those competitive baking or cooking shows, at the end of the timer, we'll give you a two-minute warning, one minute, then we'll count down from 10 seconds. Once we're done, we're going to say hands off. Everyone's hands have to be like this. We have a tape measure. We're going to measure the height of your tower from the base of your table to wherever in your tower your marshmallow sits. If you put your marshmallow halfway up in your tower, that's all we're measuring. So you want to make sure that your tower places your marshmallow as tall or as, as tall as it can within the, the structure that you're building. Does that make sense? Any questions on the instructions? You can only use these supplies. All right, if no questions, time begins now. Team one. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone look have your attention. Team one. Ten inches. Team two. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Can we measure the fact that it was 
up there. <laughs> <laughs> One inch. Wait, can we put it this way? Please. Not going to get you anything. Just give us like half a <laughs> Team three. Look at this. 26 inches. Team four. <laughs> it fell apart. Disqualified. Disqualified. You could only use the supplies you were given. Team five. Hold on. I'm not sure what this one will be. Yes, I am. One inch. <clears throat> All right. So in a quick wrap up, let's give it up for team three because clearly team three won. We'll get to the prizes in a minute, but first, let's talk about some lessons learned. <laughs> so first off, how was that exercise? Okay, I was Pretty good? Do you feel like you had a clear understanding of what the market was looking for, what I asked you for to deliver? You wanted the marshmallow high. Wanted the marshmallow high. Would it be safe to say, I wanted a tower? Well, we said the marshmallow tower. We wanted the marshmallow as high as it could be. So something more than what you guys provided. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Something more than nothing. So I'm thrilled that this team was really, they came up with the tower here. This was success. If we're talking about iteration, much better success than not hitting that first one of not getting it, right? Clearly understanding what could be used or not. And I know there was some fun involved, and that's cool. But you want to think about what's really going to make it happen, right? <coughs> How many of you, before you began building your tower, drew a prototype? Did anyone draw a picture of what they thought it would look like? Over here, can I see your picture? Oh, these, we had two ideas. Because we initially wanted the marshmallow to be in the middle, but then you said it had to be on the top, so we had to change it. Right, well, it could have been in the middle. We would only have measured it to the middle, yeah, not to the top. Yeah, we to do it so it could yep. extend even more. But prototypes are powerful. Can anyone tell me why? <coughs> yes. And it's a good way to help plan out and sort of model it. It's a good way to plan out and model it for sure. Everyone's on the same page. Everyone's on the same page. It gives a vision, right? A uniform vision. You can talk about things in words, but you've ever heard the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? We say to product owners often, product managers often, what's your product vision? Does your team know? Do they know what your product is supposed to do in the market? What problems it's supposed to solve? So a prototype is a great way to do that. One last question, and there's so many more I could ask, but just in the interest of time, did anyone think to test the weight of the marshmallow on the spaghetti before it was on the tower? <laughs> yep, yeah, hold on one second. Can I have everyone's attention? Yes. Yeah, we thought it was important to do that before because in like past we've seen that like the marshmallow so I would, I would hypothesize it's no small connection that the team that thought to test their marshmallow before they put it on the tower won the exercise. Because really, think of the learning that that gets you as a team. When you put out a software product, in the case of software, you don't want to just put out something that looks pretty but crashes after you go past 10 users. Or you don't want to put out something that has no performance in it and really is so slow that people can't stand even interfacing with it. So you want to have those parameters, we call them non-functional requirements, really understood. But you also want to know that your testing is done early and often through your iterative process. Because that's where the team's going to learn what works, what doesn't, how to pivot, and how to course correct. Does that make sense? All right, couple things. Why do we do the marshmallow challenge? First off, know that it's been done all over the world. There's plenty of pictures here. Thousands upon thousands of people have, uh, have done this challenge. There's an interesting one. When you take a look at that one there. Some more, very similar to a lot of what I'm seeing here today. We do this activity because we think, while simple, it provides some deep lessons. So a couple thoughts about those lessons. So let's take a look. The first one, as I asked, Prototyping matters. Getting that single vision of everyone focused on the same goal and the same idea. The only thing that's for sure about a plan, even the best of plans, is that it will change as soon as it begins. And if the team doesn't all have the same idea of what the end goal is, they're not going to know when they're <laughs> off track. So the, the days of just you know, force feeding and delegating to people and telling them exactly what to do and how to do it and by when it needs to be done 
aren't going to fly in today's world of constant change. So prototyping matters. All right, so typical process, progress, and I think you guys saw this. You're up there, you're doing this, you're orienting, you're planning, you're building, you have success, ta-da, and then oops. <laughs> what happens, right? What happens when you hit that point? Well, a couple things. When you hit it, what did you do? First off, let me ask you, as a group, who do you think consistently performs poorly in the marshmallow exercise? What group of individuals? Kindergarten, Kindergarten. Kindergarten perform badly. Interesting. I think the older you get, the worse you do. The older you get, the worse you do. How old are you guys? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, as we take a look at this, recent business school grads, I hope I'm not insulting anyone here. <laughs> The idea behind it is you've gone through all these years of school and typically you go through these major you know, quarterly projects where at the end you show everything you've done. Not very iterative. You really want to have the experience of building and working on things collaboratively but also iteratively. By contrast, who performs well? Go ahead, you can shine now. Kindergartners. <laughs> Kindergartners. Why do we think that might be? They just want to have fun. They want to build it. What were you going to add? I was going to say, like, sometimes they'll start with it on the top and then, like, build down. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like they're willing to go at it from any way, and if it falls down, you just start again. They don't have a preconceived notion that we must be the best or the top. They just want to have fun and enjoy it. Don't underestimate the power of a team working together, enjoying what they do, and really being self-motivated to have individual and collective impact as part of that team. So why? Well, let's take a look at a couple of things here. Business students, you know, work, 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 and then ta-da, they're done. But by contrast, those kindergarten students do what I just said. They iterate throughout. It builds, it falls, they build it again, and they learn from that. And that's how they get higher about it. So that process of prototyping and refinement is a valuable one. Lesson two, diverse skills matter. We didn't have a lot of time to talk about that today, but we bring the class typically through this experience. The average height of a marshmallow tower is usually about 20 inches. Business school grads, like we said, tend to fall below that. Uh, lawyers tend to do a bit better. Uh, kindergartners, like we said, tend to be above the average. Architects and engineers, thankfully, tend to be very much above the average, and we would hope that they are. Society appreciates their contributions. CEOs tend to do a little bit above average as well. But I said that skill sets matter. This is a skill set we could add to a team of CEOs. Let's say that you're all CEOs. Congratulations, you've done really well in your careers. You're now all CEOs of your own company. We put you on the same table together on the same team. What are you all going to do when you're collaborating? You're likely going to say, you need to do it this way because I'm the CEO. Well, put five of you on the team together and five of you are going to want to do it your own way there's going to be a challenge there, right? So what's the skill set we might add to your team? An executive admin who can help to corral the insanity and basically say, listen, you're all CEOs, great, you're successful, let's get past that now. What are we going to do to meet the goal? And having someone in the team who can facilitate the process is critical for success. In Scrum, that individual is called the Scrum Master. That's the role for it. In Kanban, it's a Kanban leader. In other processes, it's someone who's got their eye in the ball for how the process is being facilitated. So specialized skills plus facilitation skills are what equals success. Lesson three, and I'm going to wrap up here, incentives magnify income, uh, outcome. And incomes as well, potentially. I was thinking of that as we take a look at this. Let's take a look at 10 teams on average. Six out of those 10 teams will have a tower of some height up to the average or maybe a little bit more. Whereas four out of 10 teams will typically fail. So we had five teams here today. How many teams failed? Two, 40%. Look at that. It came out exactly to what the average is. I'm sorry? What do you call that team though? They got disqualified. They failed. That's true, that's a good point. I don't want to say that you guys are above average when it comes to failing, but you've drawn that conclusion, not me. So we'll take a look at that. There was this company, Autodesk, they gave a $10,000 challenge to 10 teams and said, whoever can build the tallest tower will win $10,000. I talked to Ian about that. He said it was not available for this program this week. <laughs> Instead, you have Chipotle, and everybody got it. There you go. <laughs> so $10,000. <clears> Remember, this was the average. How do you think those 10 teams did with the $10,000 check at stake? Just as bad? Worse? Worse? Anyone else? 
Remember, that's the average. That's how the 10 teams did. Everyone went at it so aggressively that no one succeeded. You guys would have won in that case if you were there. Didn't matter if you were at just a few inches because no one else would have met it. Four months later, they went back to those same group of 10 teams. Remember, that was the average. No $10,000 check on the line this time. But everyone had the experience of having done the Marshmallow Challenge once. And their goal was, again, to see as a company how well they could do. How do you think they did the second time out? Better? Here's the results. Not only better, much better. Look at the results across the board. 90% succeeding. Why? As we take a look at it, incentives plus low skills, they didn't have the experience, is not a formula for success. By contrast, the incentives with the high skills, meaning they have that experience, will lead them to success. You get high skills through iteration. The faster your iterative cycle, the more experience you gain. The more experience you gain, the greater your results can be. The longer the cycles that you have for iteration, the less opportunities for learning there are. So think about those items along the way. So why do we conduct the Marshmallow Challenge? It's really just to get teams thinking about the marshmallows impacting their projects. We hope you enjoyed the exercise. With that, Michelle's going to close this out in two minutes, and I think we're done for the evening. 30 seconds. She's fast. Uh, Go ahead, 30 Michelle. 30 seconds. Just two resources we want to share with you. If you want to learn more about Agile, please go on Google. You can download the Scrum Guide. Free. You know, we don't want to spend any money. Uh, free PDF you can download online to learn more about Agile. Um, another one, Matt and Goat Software with Mike Cohn. He's actually co-authored some textbooks that uh, for some tech majors you'll see within your education. Uh, so he's really great accredited. Uh, and... We have our bottom line branding items on your desk. Uh, we are hiring. We're so happy to be here today. Thank you so much for inviting us. Um, it means a lot for us to be a part of your success and your continued education. Um, and I'd like to ask for one last favor before you all leave. We have a poster right there. It says what went well and what could have gone better. Uh, if you don't mind, just take 20 seconds to write a quick feedback for us and just post it on the board before you leave. Um, it'll help us make this a better experience the next time we run it. So thank you again. Um, if you have any questions about Bottom Line, please reach out to Julie Morris at bottomline.com. You can also connect with her on LinkedIn. Uh, she'll be expecting you guys. Two last quick points if I could add in. With regard to what went well, something that you liked, something that made an impact, an aha moment, something that you learned. Those are always great. For the what could have gone better, don't think of it as a complaint. If you said, you know, this could have gone better or whatever it is, think of an action that we could take to make it better. Give us that action statement, your idea. We're going to rerun this program next week, and all the students who come in are going to actually benefit from your feedback. We're going to work to incorporate it. That's our iterative cycle. So please contribute to that. That would be great. So if you can do that on the way out the door, one item at least for what went well, one idea for an action statement, what could go better, and team one, you get the really cool bottom line tumblers. Everybody please join. Uh, thank, thank you, you very much. Jenna,